All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is turn 38 of Once More Into the Breach, and let's see how that invasion of Niflheim is going. Shouldn't be going too badly, since they are AI at this point. Uh, we've received a Bloodstone from Hinnom. Great. We've researched Evocation up to level 4 and are now turning to Construction. Summoned some Fire Ants, a crippled unit died, that's okay. A battle in Ozandius between Beratos and Tianxi. So this is just Beratos cleaning up some province defense. Most of their army is these Baratian soldiers, which are okay, a little bit better than my infantry. Uh, they do have a couple of war elephants and some elite soldiers, which are overall superior, including having better resistance. Or protection, rather. And this was just province defense with some barbarians, like one point of province defense. In Linshire, uh, that was the wrong button. In Linshire, so we were attacking Niflheim here with a Buddha and my prophet. And that Buddha, ah uh, yes, I, I didn't cast Iron Skin, so he's just spamming some skeletons out. Okay, the skeletons are getting banished. Uh, the Buddha is being targeted by the archers, interestingly, which is a little bit unfortunate. But it looks like he's doing... up. Oh, he just took a hit there. He just got shot so hard he got a disease. Well, that sucks. I think it's a little bit weird that diseases are a possible, um... a possible hit option, but, uh, oh well. It sure happened to him. And he ran away because of that. But my prophet is still fighting, and the armies of Niflheim are routed. So, we won. Unfortunately, we did get diseased, but at least he'll live a little while with the disease. There may be a way to remove it, I'm not sure. I do have nature magic. We'll work it out. Anyway, he retreated successfully. Good. In Belfields. Let's view the battle in Belfields. Okay, we've got our Buddha over here, and duh. This is quite the army. Okay, so this is a Niflheimish army, including a number of infantry and four Gigjas. So somehow I don't feel like this went well, and spine devils and all kinds of stuff. Okay. Yeah, somehow I uh, somehow I doubt this was good for me. He's dropped Iron Skin on himself, so he's up to Protection 20, which is good. But, uh, yeah, here come the Serpent Fiends. So they're going to come in, and then the Clockwork Horrors are going to come in as well. Clockwork Horrors are an Earth Summon from the Construction School. They have Exhaustion, so they gain 15 Fatigue per turn, and of course, once they hit 100 Fatigue, they just kind of shut down. So they have 6 turns. In those 6 turns, they move very quickly, they have High Protection, and they have two fairly high damage slashing attacks. Um, I don't personally think they're worth it. They're basically just a way to clear out chaff. And I mean, they, they stop functioning after six turns. But in this situation, they did pretty well because they had a couple turns left and my Buddha just died. And yeah, that was... Uh... Okay. Well, I did not expect to run into an army there. So, uh, we killed four of the Clockwork Horrors and a Long Dead and a Serpent Fiend. So... Not an entire loss, but uh, having a were hyena killed, having a Buddha killed that way is a little bit distressing. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Hinnom attacked Agartha with a Melkart and won against province defense. In Mark... Where is Mark? Ah, Mark is this field province up here. Yes, I sent Matwa out. And he's facing province defense. He's got an iron skin. He's got some cavalry coming in, so get those skeletons out. He got the skeletons out in time. They're just light cavalry. And since he is a three earth Buddha, he can spam skeletons pretty efficiently. Uh, Marcadas are, of course, no threat to anyone. They do have a high defense, but that's all they have. And now he's casting Frighten for some reason. Uh, wow. Interesting. Did you see that? So he just threw a Blade Wind at point-blank range and killed all three of them uh, just because they happened to be standing directly in front of him. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And he's now unconscious. But with his amount of reinvigoration, 
He's got four reinvigoration, so he'll come back to consciousness pretty soon. I think. It'll be a little bit. It'll, it'll be a little while. But these Marcadas, they're focused on throwing rocks at him, which is highly inefficient because he has 20 protection. And their attack sucks so much, they can barely fight the skeletons. So he's going to raise a few more dead. And the Marcadas are going to run because their morale is crap. And the province defense routes. So that was closer than I would like. But the Iron Skin saved him. In the Silver Woods. What have we got going on here? So this is my uh, smaller army. A couple of Buddhas. Uh, back here we have a, dis a distraction squad. Decent number of pygmies and a pretty okay chunk of infantry. Fighting a small army, including a bone reader. And some province defense. A mound king and some undead. Okay. So we did get flaming arrows out. We still have two uh, fire gems, but I think she's now going to spend those fire gems summoning fire elementals. Yeah, this the flaming arrows are a little bit overkill for this uh, this battle. Uh, she actually used both her gems summoning that one fire elemental. So okay, fair enough. And I'm getting lots of flaming arrows friendly fire, I believe. But the infantry can take it, so they're going to charge in. They're going to face this. Uh, Oh, the prophet! This is their. This is Niflheim's prophet. Okay. Well, he's dead now. So, what were my casualties there? So, I lost three hyena clan warriors, nine pygmies, two enemy arrow fire mainly, and nine rhino clan warriors. Okay, acceptable. I cleared out this small army and the province defense. In Dothian. Uh, Yomi continues their rampage through Tianxi's territory. I f I'm starting to feel like Tianxi is not long for this world. I mean, they're they're getting kind of eaten from two sides, and I don't know how they can come back from it, to be perfectly frank. This was a lot of province defense to lose. Unexpected events. Uh, our barbarian horde has attacked and pillaged the province. I expected this. That was why I moved troops there. And so you can see here... The Independence Attack, it's a horde of Barbarians, which are high damage but low defense. And I've got uh, my Buddha here, Badalini, in addition to all the province defense. Including a Lion Tribe Witch Doctor. Ooh, with two nature. Interesting. So basically, he's going to Legions of Steel very ineffectively. And then start spamming out skeletons, because skeletons are a pretty good counter to barbarians. Yes, uh, barbarians do a whole bunch of damage to them, but skeletons die pretty easily anyway. And their, their attack is high enough to hit that terrible, terrible defense skill. So, all the barbarians are driven off. Excellent. Uh, no casualties that matter, just some province defense. In Furia, we lost money. Ugh. In Trollland, we got gems. And in Trensibor we got gems. Excellent. We lost a scout in the Bright Woods, and we completed our fortress in Typhalia. So now we can recruit one of these suckers every single turn, which is fantastic. This actually also has higher resources than either of these places, although much lower recruitment points. Okay, so Tianxi has kind of been making a comeback here. They just retook Tlash, it looks like. This is the main Baratian army, and that is the Yomish army coming to beat them up. Oh, and that's where the ghouls went. The ghouls went south. Interesting. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to do, uh, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is look and see if there's a nature item that I can forge. The Miraculous Cure-All Elixir heals diseases. It requires nature five. Huh. Huh. What other options are there? There's the Ring of Regeneration. You could potentially use the Ring of Regeneration and just keep getting into fights. And that would keep your health up. It wouldn't stop you from accumulating... Um, accumulating afflictions, unfortunately. Which is kind of what you need. Otherwise, the disease will eventually just kill you anyway. I mean, you'll build up so many afflictions that it's like life isn't worth living. 
The Thistle Mace is an item that I need for the nature magic boosting powers, but that'll that'll come in the future. For now, I'm just going to take these lions, give them all to Mugo here, set them up front, and we're going to retake Glimmering Fields here for the income. Uh, Mugo is going to just cast spells. Taking out, like, one guy won't be too much of a problem. I could switch to recruiting Buddhas here, but I really need more... More Lion Royalty would be good. Having a few high-level nature mages floating around is never a bad thing. Uh, yeah, up here, the... So, Agartha's army is now moving out towards the Hinnomite uh, frontier. That's their god. And this province has just been retaken. Down here we've got Badalini. These are the trolls that just took over my former province, which I'm not a big fan of. Now up here, I've got two armies of Niflheimish troops under AI control. The problem is uh, I miscalculated as I realized soon after I submitted the turn and actually managed to get anything done about it, but Zamzam is now out of fire gems. And being out of fire gems, she can't now cast flaming arrows, which makes this army a lot less effective than it otherwise would be. Uh, Materi Meshi is also out of fire gems. He had, a f I thought he had a fire in a jar, but no, he just had one fire gem. So he can't cast Phoenix Power, which means he is also much less effective than he could otherwise be. Um, and I don't have any death gems either, so I can't cast Corpse Candle, which otherwise would be a pretty decent way to do this, because Corpse Candles wither people, and you get three for one. So, yeah. I'm going to set you to casting Seven Year Fever, I think, in the hopes of diseasing enemy commanders, maybe. You, however, you can cast Phoenix Power, and then you do have four fire. And with four fire, you can what? You can throw larger fire clouds, or you can throw cheaper and more powerful fire balls. Uh, yeah, I guess just fireball spam is where it's at at this point. Uh, fireball, fireball, where'd you go? There you are. And I'm going to need eagle eyes there right after phoenix power. Okay, then you were casting Earth Meld. Yeah, that's probably best for you, Simai. Now, do I have another Earth 3 Buddha? I do, Katibu. Katibu gets the Bloodstone. And once he gets an... Once I get uh, another pair of Earth Boots built, he will also get those. So you forge me another pair of Earth Boots. You all are researching. Great. All of these pygmies are going with Horseman and moving to the front. Ooh, pygmies have a uh, pygmies have pretty decent map move, I guess. Yeah, map move fourteen, not bad. So these troops are going to move there. This guy Ficurini, who is diseased now, retreated from this battle, but still won. The AI tends to pr attack pretty mindlessly, so these armies, I assume, are going to attack me. What that means is I need to move these troops up to reinforce the siege. I'm also going to move these troops back to reinforce the siege, except that I think I have enough Buddhas. So these two Buddhas, Heshima and Simai, are actually going to go over here to take that province and burn down the temple. This Buddha, Matwa, I can't take that fortress because it's mainly Gigjas. I might actually be able to take the province if they don't defend the fortress, but instead I think probably a better plan is Matwa has literally no gear. Hmm. That's Niflheim. So the better plan for Matwa is to go up there, I think. Take that province away. Leave, like, some province defense here. Leave some province defense here. 
and here. Because these two armies, I especially I assume, are going to combine. And when they combine, it's going to take my big army to defeat them. Uh, now, in this province, I'm going to end up with a pretty sizable army. You know, that's 60-some... That's like 130, 140, 200... Uh, yeah, about something like 300 units or more. A little bit more, actually. Uh, and a lot of magical support from five Buddhas. So I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with this army dealing with these two together. Uh, Fikirini, however, needs to probably just get out of here, to be honest. Actually, Fikirini can sneak around. Because once when he's sneaking, he's not really in any danger. They can't patrol in the Silver Woods exactly. Ooh, there's a friendly civilization here. How nice. Shahidi, however, just needs to run. I mean, there's nothing he can do. Down here, um, Funny Guy. What can Funny Guy forge that would be useful? Rune Smashers are actually super useful if you're casting spells that are resisted with magic resistance, because it gives you a two-point penetration bonus. I'm not, however, so Funny Guy probably just needs to forge me some more winged shoes. They let you fly. I mean, the downside is you can't wear any of the boots that actually help. But, uh, like, help with reinvigoration or anything. But you can still wear girdles of might. And flying shoes are great for deep striking raiders. Um, that said, I don't think I need his specific skill set right now. So I'm thinking... I'm going to change shape, drop the hammer off, and Funny Guy is going to head back out to start searching for magic sites again, because I need better gem income. My gem income at this point is pretty okay, but not exceptional, and not, like, something that I love. So um, let me finish making my moves, and I'll get back to you in a minute. All right, so I think my moves are set up. Uh, what I'm doing, as I said, I'm pulling these armies together to join at Wellrid. I'm going to try and take that fort as fast as I possibly can. It'll actually have reasonable resources once I've done that. And as well, I'll get access to this waterfall for more air and water gems, which aren't terribly useful to me, but there's something. Uh, I'm moving this funny guy out to start searching for magic sites again. I am forging a thistle mace for Kinda, and once I have that thistle mace he will use it to boost himself up and start summoning uh, nature creatures, because I have a number of, here, just to show you, I have a number of pretty cool nature summons. I can summon Kithironic Lions, which are very large, fairly powerful lions with lots of protection. They're nice, expensive, but nice. I can contact Forest Trolls, which are pretty good summons. They cost about two nature gems each, but they regenerate very, very quickly. Um, and two gems for a troll is not bad, especially because with the Thistle Mace I'll actually get six. Uh, I can also summon Leogryphs, which are pretty solid. They're half lion, half eagle. They have high magic resistance, which is what's nice about them. Most animals do not. Most animals have terrible magic resistance. And you get a lot of them. Uh, if I summon Leogryphs, I'll get 14 for 12 nature gems, which is not a bad trade. Spirits of the Wood would be useful, except that they have homesickness, so you can't move them out of the province that you summon them in without them losing health. You do get a whole bunch of them, which is nice, but basically this is only useful for, like, emergency defense. So that's what Kinda is going to be doing pretty much for the rest of his life. I need to take these gems away from him and give some of them to Mema. Give her, like, six. Because Mima is going to be the one actually leading the army. She's going to cast Flaming Arrows, Strength of Gaia. Strength of Gaia will boost her uh, Nature Magic up to 3. And with Nature Magic 3, she will be able to cast Howl, which is a spell that summons just tons of wolves from everywhere, and to basically harass enemy uh, casters. She will, of course, need Nature Gems in order to accomplish that, which is why I just gave her some. And Strength of Gaia by itself will cost extra gems for her, because it should theoretically require three nature magic to cast in the first place. Actually, to be honest, to be honest, I may... Well, it gives regeneration and bark skin, 
So it's it's a good use of a gem or two. I am going to set her on to conservative gem usage, which will slow her down, but she'll get the flaming arrows out first, then she'll cast Strength of Gaia, and then she'll be able to howl a little later on in the battle. Should be decent. She's taking all of these fire ants off to war. Uh, she technically has three squads instead of two, so there is a morale penalty, which is a problem because pygmies have no morale anyway, but she'll be able to shunt some of them off on somebody else as soon as she reaches the actual front. I do need to take the Yellow Mountains back at some point, but I'm not too worried about it because the Yellow Mountains are not a hugely valuable province. Badalini is going to come back up here to rejoin the party. Uh, I am also forging Earth Boots for Katibu. That will kick him up to Earth 5. Uh, I can also, actually I'll need to put some on Funny Guy sometime as soon as I hit Construction 6 in order to forge the Staff of Elemental Mastery. And then I'll give that to Katibu, and then he'll be at Earth 6 and able to cast Earth Blood Deep Well. My research has kicked way up because I've been spending all of my Death Gems forging Skull Mentors. And of course I'm now recruiting mages from more forts than ever. I have started back recruiting mages at this fort. I'll be recruiting sages at one per turn. And I'm still recruiting here and here and here. As well as Buddhas up top. So overall I think we're in a pretty good place. I will hit construction 5 next turn. After that it'll be probably, hopefully only two turns before I get construction level 6 and can forge Staffs of Elemental Mastery. So that'll be just time for Funny Guy to move out, search this province for magic sites, and come back, receive his staff, or receive his um, boots and Dwarven Hammer, and then forge the Staff of Elemental Mastery with uh, Earth and, and Air. It's Earth and Air, and I have the gems for that. I may alchemize a whole bunch of my water gems, that's fine. I'm not doing anything with them right now. I may also try to arrange a trade with Hinnom, maybe swap him a whole bunch of blood slaves for some gems of some type, especially earth gems, but honestly I don't really want to give him a whole bunch more blood slaves unless I have to, because Hinnom is already a little bit scary, with all his milk arts and blood magic and all. Uh, in other world news, uh, Tianxi is still just getting the crap kicked out of them. I'm not sure if or how they're going to survive, and I'm thinking I should join the dog pile sometime soon. I do have this little force here, 63 assorted lions, infantry, and pygmies. And I also have a couple of Buddhas. I've got Mandara, I've got Hassan, I'll have another one next turn. So my forces down here are not insignificant, and if I could pick off a couple of these provinces, that would be nice. In particular, I really, really want Chilad, and they've got nothing here. I would love to take Chilad, but I think with Yomi right there, odds are low, because that's a pretty significant army, and it's not going away. So we'll have to see what can be worked out, but probably I'm just going to have to go to war with Yomi at some point here. I am taking back this province that the ghouls took from me, I think I mentioned that. And uh, we'll see where we go from there. I don't know where these armies are going to go. They might go up north to try and relieve the attack on Niflheim. They may come down south towards me. I'm just kind of falling back to let them take empty provinces if they want. Because I can't really deal with them. But uh, we'll be able to deal with them in a turn or two. And I think Welrid will be going down, if not this coming turn, then next turn. Especially with all these extra troops I'm moving in. This army will add 87 Siege Strength, this army will add 26 Siege Strength, so over 100 extra Siege Strength, on top of the 103 I already have. So yeah, that should be, uh, yeah, what's the Siege Strength of these guys? One, okay. So yeah, doubling my Siege Strength there, that'll still only bring it up to 200, so it'll probably take two more turns, possibly even three, to take down Wilred. <clears throat> Excuse me, but as long as I just keep it under siege, uh, it'll be fine, and I can free up maybe some of my Buddhas to go do other things. I am utterly convinced, by the way, that this province is indeed what's cursing people, because look, four of these guys are cursed at this point, so there's definitely some magic site here that is cursing people. Uh, it could be nature, it could be death, I believe there's also an astral site. Somebody was saying there's also an astral site that curses people. I'm not sure what it is, but in any case, there's something here cursing people, so I need to get somebody in to sight search this place for nature magic, 
and somebody for astral magic. I am moving one of my crystal sorceresses to start searching for air and astral in all these places. It'll be a slow process, but I got to get started now because we are more than half. We are about halfway through the game, I believe. I believe the apocalypse is going to start on, yeah, game settings, cataclysm turn 84. So it's turn 38 now. At turn 42, we'll officially be halfway through the game. And frankly, most Dominions games are effectively decided by turn 60 or so. I think it's a little bit unusual for a Dominions game to be in turn 5 with more than like one or two competitors remaining. So we'll see who that is. As I said last turn, I'm starting to get nervous about Ur because Ur does own a huge swath of territory and have a ton of resources. If I can get the Alpha Strike, I could probably eliminate them. But getting the Alpha Strike is a little bit, eh, a little bit uncertain sometimes. I do, however, have a bit of an ace in the hole. I have air boots. I have flying shoes, which most people may not realize or not be thinking about the fact that I can craft with Funny Guy because he has air magic. In fact, I can have him forge air boosters that I could then give to these ladies, and then they could forge flying shoes. So I have access to flying raiders which other people may not account for hopefully not but in any case i need to start putting scouts into this area um i kind of want to keep recruiting scouts here but i also desperately want more wizards and nine points a turn is actually not that much i think i'm going to keep recruiting scouts never mind that i'm just going to keep recruiting scouts here and uh yeah why am I down to 492 per month? I need to be at 502. I was at 504 just a minute ago. Who did I change the orders of? Oh, Asher. Yeah, research, dude. Please continue to research. Okay, so that is going to be it for this turn. Yep, I'll hit construction 5 next turn, and then two turns after that should be construction 6. So we are in pretty good shape. Ficarini is going to sneak up here. Just in case, actually, this province is perfectly safe, so you know what, Figurini, don't sneak. Search for magic sites, dude. See if there's an earth site or a fire site that Niflheim couldn't find, because they don't have earth or fire magic. But in any case, that's going to be it for this turn, and I will see you in turn 39. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, it is 39, turn 39, that is, in Once More Into the Breach. Uh, the war continues apace up north. I did have a small reverse this turn. Uh, two of my Buddhas attacked this province here and ran smack into Tiazzi the Abductor. And let's actually take a look at that battle, not that one, this one. Just to show you what Tiazzi the Abductor has been up to. He is, as I said, a national hero. Um, the issue is Tiazzi is geared. Uh, before he went AI, the Niflheimish player gave Tiazzi a whole bunch of stuff. He has an enchanted shield, an enchanted spear, a horror helmet, which gives him extra fear. Black steel plate for protection, combined with the horror helmet that pushes his protection value up to, uh, I would say, ludicrous. He has winged shoes, allowing him to fly even when he's not in eagle form. He can turn into an eagle. A water lens, which gives him a temporary water gem in every battle. And a blood pendant, which gives him extra strength and dark vision. So overall, uh, on top of his, of course, normal chill aura and his ice protection and his far caster ability that he has. So this is actually a very, very scary unit. High defense skill, very high protection, decent morale and magic resistance, and a lot of hit points. Combined with his high magical paths, even under AI control, it's difficult to deal with Chiazzi. Uh So I lost, actually, one of my were hyenas in that battle and Simai retreated. Now, Simai retreated to Mark, so he went north, which is a little bit of a problem because I don't really want Simai to be isolated like that, so I'm just sneaking him back down. Uh, up here, Matwa has found a province with just all kinds of gem income. Unfortunately, I'm not getting that gem income because I don't have a line to my own territory, to a fort where I can collect it, or a lab, rather. So, Matwa is going to hit this province here and then kind of sneak his way back down. Over here we have a whole bunch of Gigjas. This is like where probably 
almost the majority of his mage core is concentrated, of Niflheim's AI mage core. This army is attacking me, is coming down through the Silver Woods. Uh, we can see that battle. Uh, it's a pretty significant army. Two Gigjas, two commanders, corpse constructs. It's mainly just a lot of random crap. It does have 29 skin shifters. Fortunately, I should be able to bring them down because of their low protection with arrow spam. And then he has a few random demons. Marcadas, Mandragoras, Long Dead Giants, etc, etc. This was just province defense. So, Wellridge should be going down probably in next turn. Uh, you can look at my army, see I have 209 siege strength there this turn. I'm moving in another 63. So, next turn the walls should go down, I believe. And the turn after that we will assault. Now, uh, you can see over here, Hinnom's army that was besieging Rus. I think they took uh, Rus. Yeah, Hinnom is being besieged by Agartha, so an Agarthan army has moved in to try and take Rus back. This is a pretty significant army here in Fogic. Uh, it has a Melkart, mainly Mazix, which are cheap little demon summons, and Fire Ants, of which I have some, uh, plus some Avite infantry and a few Amis. The Melkart is really the biggest problem. There is apparently at least one Manticore in the army as well. Just to look at Fire Ants, I don't, I'm not sure if I showed them before. They are size 4, which kind of hurts them, and undisciplined. But they have pretty good hit points, decent protection, their attack skill is okay, and their attack is also poisonous. So the enemy hit by it will take armor negating poison damage every round after that. They don't eat, they're mindless, so they're immune to a whole bunch of mind affecting spells, and they have high map move. Also, you can summon them very efficiently. Uh, the Summon Fire Ants spell gets you a whole bunch of Fire Ants all at once, which is nice. Yeah, it gets you more than one per gem, depending on what level you are. I am actually summoning uh, Forest Trolls right now. I'll get six, because this guy has a Vine Mace, which makes him nature four. And Forest Trolls are very, very tough critters that regenerate, so I think that's probably worth it. You can also get uh, regular old Earth Trolls, which I think are better... But uh, Forest Trolls are pretty good. What do you mean, unable to cast this spell right now? Oh, because he's already casting it. Duh. I could actually get... I could have Kinda summon Forest Trolls as well. No, not Forge. Hmm. Nah, I'm short one gem. Anyway, uh, Kithironic Lions. I kind of want to like Kithironic Lions, but I'm, not sure, I'm just not sure they're worth five gems each. That's a pretty steep price. If you mass them, they're tough, but eh, they have decent protection, not huge protection, but decent. And they're size 3, and they have a couple attacks each, so they do some damage. I'm, I'm just not sure they're really worth it. You can also just summon Great Lions, which could be worthwhile. I've never exp I've never cast that spell before. Um, not sure whether it's really worth it or not. I mean, it'll get you 12 to 14 for 10 gems, which isn't bad for chaff. For now, however, we're focusing on research. We did hit construction level 5 last turn. We should be able to get construction level 6 in two turns here, and then we'll turn to enchantment, which hopefully will only take about three or four turns, probably four turns total, uh, at which point I hope to have enough earth gems saved up to cast uh, the spell immediately. Uh, once we hit construction 6, of course, I'll be moving Funny Guy back to construct the Staff of Elemental Mastery, give it to Katibu, who has 5 Earth right now because of the Earth Boots and the Blood Stone, and then he will use that in order to cast uh, the Earth Blood Deep Well to give me a massive Earth Gem income and allow me to just spam out Earth Summons. In random events this turn, I did have Fukan taken over by villains. Over here I am casting Terracotta Army to give me some Chaff and getting a whole bunch of Pygmies, and we'll go take that province back next turn. Uh, there were several battles, including Tianxi broke out of their own capital, which had been besieged, and they lost a lot in the process. I mean, they lost about half their army, for one thing, but they lost two of their Celestial Masters, which is a big blow. They also lost a Master of the Five Elements. They lost uh, almost all of their Celestial Soldiers, a few Demons of Heavenly Rivers, and two-thirds of the Warriors of the Five Elements that were involved. So this army... It looks like they've only lost half their numbers. They've actually lost more than half of their killing power um, because they lost about half the archers, two-thirds of the Warriors of the Five Elements, and 
a good chunk of their sacred demons, as well as two of their big mages. The army of Yomi uh, did lose two Onishugos and their Dai Oni, so that was a huge blow to Yomi. Uh, they do still have a couple of Chunaris in the, the force, which is good. And otherwise, they mainly lost Chaff. I mean, they lost a whole bunch of Ko-Onis, so they may have to fall back. In terms of killing power, I think Yomi actually came out better than Tianxi did. There was also a battle in Dothian, where Yomi attacked Tianxi and won, and in the process they wiped out four very minor mages, two middling mages, and uh, a bunch of horsemen, archers, and warriors of the five elements. So that was a decisive victory for Yomi. I'm actually going to view that real quick just to see how his Dionis were scripted. Okay, so it was a siege. He still hasn't given his Dionis any gear, which is interesting. I would have thought he would have liked to have them you know, equipped. But mainly it looks like his demons are just spamming evocations, which, to be fair, Bladewind in this situation is a pretty good cast. Got all the fireballs going in. We've got bolts of unlife. Oh, there come the shadow blasts. There go the shadow blasts. Mainly missing. Did some damage up there. Yeah, he's, he's leaning very heavily on shadow blast. Which is a powerful spell, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, in particular, it can paralyze people as well as doing a whole bunch of damage. And then the sheer numbers of demons just overwhelmed what infantry Tianxi could muster here. Okay, so he's not scripting them to actually go and fight. He's just using them as evocation spammers still. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Something to keep in mind. Uh, definitely when you fight Yomi, you want fire resistance because a lot of their Onis can throw flames, uh, which are armor-piercing. So dropping some fire resistance wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. They can also spit poison, so fire and poison resistance could both be valuable. Might be worthwhile using um, mechanical men or something that's already resistant. But yeah, battle's over. Okay. So that's all going down there. Uh, the Nifelheim AI is fighting Ur as well as me. Uh, this is one Melkart taking out province defense. I think it's that same Melkart that we saw before. And you can see he's got thug equipment, basically. He's got regeneration, reinvigoration, a vine shield and a frost brand, and flying shoes. So really, this guy is very, very tough to take down. He is very expensive. I mean, this is... I think this is 5 gems, 15, 25, 30. I think it's 35 gems worth of gear. Plus the cost of the Melkart. So, you know. Expensive. But, uh, of course, the expense means he can just take any province that doesn't have an outright army in it pretty quickly. Especially when he casts Body Ethereal on himself. So that's about all that's going on right now. Um, I did get some gold in Wellroot, which is nice. Uh, beyond that, we are basically just kind of... Oh, Fikirini is about to die from his disease. I'm moving him back here. I hope he only loses one hit point this turn. Uh, yeah, I really hope he does, because if he only loses one hit point, he'll get back into this province, and I can take his earth boots and give them to somebody else. I should honestly have moved him back last turn. But that's about all that's happening. Down here, I did have a whole bunch of money this turn. So down here, I am recruiting more lions to build up my force here to go to war with whoever it is that I need to fight down here, either Tianxi or Baratos. Uh, I'm also recruiting sages, of course, still there. Still recruiting scouts in this province. Um, I know I have a fortress there that I could be using, but I just feel like I need more, more vision. Uh, I have Mugo searching for nature sites. Uh, of course... Funny Guy is searching for sites here in Furia, and my armies are converging on Wellrid. Once I've taken Wellrid, I'll be able to crush these armies in straight-up combat. Uh, Tiazzi is tough, but with his low-level equipment, he won't be able to stand up in a face-to-face -face fight. So Niflheim is definitely going the way of all the Earth. I'm not sure what Ur is doing, because all of these provinces are now owned by Niflheim again. So... I'm thinking possibly he's besieging Niflheim and I just can't see it. But we will find out soon. 
So that's going to be the turn, everybody. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to turn 40 of Once More Into the Breach. This is actually the start of the turn. I've just fired this up, and I was definitely going to, um, you know, skip ahead through my moves, but there was a battle in Rus between Hinnom and Agartha, which I think we'll want to see. Uh, Hinnom had invaded Rus and, I believe, taken it, and then Agartha had countersieged them, I think is what happened. So this should be a really, really significant major army clash that should give us some good insight into Hinnom's strategy. So, let's pause right away as the messages scroll. So, over on Hinnom's side, we have a front line of fire ants. We've talked about them. We've got some Avite spearmen. We've got a long line of Avite heavy archers. We've got quite a lot of Amis, which have, uh, I believe, two linked random paths. And in this case, that's an Aha who is carrying a Cornucopia, which gives him temporary nature gems. And so we've got, yeah, we've got two fire there, two fire there, both with fires in a jar to help him cast Phoenix Power. We've got two air there for lightning bolts. We've got several two astral, uh, another two fire, a three nature carrying a thistle mace, uh, another two fire with a staff of flame focus. So lots of mixed Amis. We've got Amnon the Melkart with a Crown of Bones that gives him Undead Command and a Horn of Valor to make him inspirational. So this is probably the leader of the army. We have three more Melkarts, so four Melkarts all told. This Melkart is kitted out in full thug gear with regeneration and girdles of might and winged shoes and a weapon. Amarapi, Chelbees, and Chizkaya. Okay, they are all kitted out for thug work. Identically. So those are three hard-hitting thug Melkarts. We have a Manticore, which is a flying unit that can cause fear and has a bunch of attacks. We have several Wyverns, which are similar, except they don't cause fear. In the back, we've got all kinds of Mazakim, which are really cheap, really easy to summon little flying devil things. They have a high defense skill, but low hit points and low protection. Um, so they're not terribly, terribly damaging, except in large numbers, which of course he has. Got a whole bunch of griffins. And then down here we have set ears. Set ears are extremely dangerous. Uh, Hinnom specific summons. They have lots of hit points, good skills overall, three attacks each, and berserker plus four, which makes them very powerful. On top of all of that, they're sacred and so can be blessed. On the other side, on Agartha's side, we have Chaff, Cave Grubs. Up in the front, we have Magma Children, a whole bunch of them mixed in with Terracotta Soldiers. Pretty solid. We have a large group of crap uh, infantry, Cavern Guards and the like. We have a single Troglite, a few more Chaff up over here. What's that? That's a Cavern White, a reanimated pale one. Back here we have the Great Ulm, uh, Mind Blast Brigade, and Wet Ones, and a whole bunch of Earth Readers. Yeah, so Earth Readers have two Earth and then something else, one Water or Death or something, along with an Oracle of Subterranean Fires, an Oracle of the Dead, two Oracles of the Dead, and an Oracle of Subterranean Fires. Okay, and this one is Twice Born, which is pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, this is definitely two large, major armies clashing. I think Hinnom is going to take it, though. I, I think they are. There go the Flyers. There goes the Blessing, I think. Are they not blessed? No, that was anti-magic. Oh, so magic resistance has gone up by four on everybody, which makes the Seir almost invulnerable to magic. And... The Melkarts are very close to in invulnerable to magic. Uh, they're also summoning a whole bunch of full-size air elementals, which is to be expected. Okay. And they're throwing up Wind Guide. Bloodlust. What does Bloodlust do? I don't know what Bloodlust does. Over here, they're casting Earth buffs mainly. Army buffs, which is fair. Okay, they've cast Howl now. 
Uh, and so the wolves are getting in. And here come the Mazakim, as well as one of the Melkarts. Uh, they're being hit by evocations, but those evocations are not going to save the forces of Agartha. Uh, lots of elementals coming in. The infantry is getting wiped out. The infantry has already been mostly wiped out, to be honest. And yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty much over already, to be honest. The Mazakim, yeah, they didn't even they didn't even bless the Seir. Didn't even bother. Lots of evocations flying in all directions. The Melkarts are back here just tearing people apart with no problem. Lots of lightning bolts coming down. Um, you can see Chelbis has taken no damage. Chizkaya has taken no damage. Amarapi has taken no damage. And yeah, that's that's the battle. Wow. Agartha just got rolled. I mean, to be fair, Hinnom lost troops. But they didn't lose anybody important. They lost a few of their Seirs. Look at the damage those Seirs caused, by the way. About four kills each. Uh, the Melkarts caused significant damage. The Avite Heavy Archers actually got a lot of kills because most of these were chaff that are not good against arrows. Even the Fire Ants did decently. Um, and the Maziks, the Maziks tore them apart. Almost half the entire Agarthan army was killed by Maziks. So, uh, yeah, this is why I say Hinnom is dangerous. Which they really, really are. With the, when they've got the Seir production rolling and the Melkarts in particular, they are extremely dangerous. So beyond that, I've summoned a bunch of stuff. I found a magic site in Furia, which is nice. There was a battle in Mark, which I think was... Yeah, just a little force coming after the small amount of province defense that I put in this province. Um, Actually, let's see if we can do this, because these are what? Jotun Spearman? Uh, I probably can't do this. Odds that I can do this are low. Yeah. Nah. Yeah, nah. Killed a couple of units, but not, not many. But that's fine. Uh, lots of battles that we can view here. There was a battle in Ostmark. Me sending in a raider. Uh, there is actually quite a bit of province defense here. Let's see if I can get my buffs and summons out before they reach me with all the cavalry. Come on, come on, skeletons, come on, skeletons, come on, skeletons. Yeah, skeletons. Skeletons. Uh, looks like I did take a hit, but no, uh, no serious problems yet. And the skeletons are doing decently. Yeah, there we go. That's it. There we go. Get those dead raised. Yep, managed to do it. Alright, cool. Yeah. Just barely, by the skin of my teeth, that heavy cavalry almost got to me. Uh, in Wellrid, we got some money. In Karnag, villains have attacked me. Uh, and the patrollers were beaten. Oh, because there's freaking 63 of them. Okay, well, it's a good thing I had these guys patrolling, I guess. Uh, we are under siege in Karnag and the walls are damaged. And Oh, crap! Figurini died. Was located in Urfel during the incident. So, did I get the boots back? I did. I got his earth boots back, I think. Good, he got here before he died. That is fantastic. Okay, so funny guy should move back there. Research-wise... Uh, I need to get, I need to free up some more research points before I can finish construction this term, which I really would like to do. So, um, what about these other battles? Let me see, in Gol Amrod, Tianxi attacked Yomi, just a small scattered force, and won. In Range of Light, Tianxi attacked Baratos, once again a very small force, and won. In Ozandius, Tianxi took a province back, and in Ophalef, Baratos who has a Melk, who have a Melkart attacked and won. So yeah, this is uh, something to keep in mind. Baratos is also a blood nation, like Hinnom is, and Baratos has a national spell that can summon Melkarts, which means they get the benefit of Melkart thuggery, just like uh, Hinnom does. 
And this Melkart has been very heavily geared. He's got the Heart of Life, uh, which gives him a lot of reinvigoration. It's expensive. Not too expensive, actually. He's also got the Heart of Quickness, which gives him more reinvigoration and quickness. Uh, wow. Flying Shoes, the Armor of Knights, which gives him a ton of protection. An Ice Helmet that gives him cold resistance, a Firebrand, and a Shield of Gleaming Gold, which gives him awe. So this guy is geared in a very, very expensive manner. I mean, this is 10, 20, 25... 30, 40, 45, it's 45 gems and 20 blood slaves have been spent on this Melkart. However, they've been spent to make him, like, really hard to deal with. Uh, he is fire and blood rather than anything better in terms of um, defense, so there's that. He might still be killable, but it's going to be tough. Okay, so I'm going to make my moves, and I will see you... Uh, after I've done that. Okay, so I think that is all my moves. So, just real quickly, um, Tianxi is in a lot of trouble. I've been talking with him. Uh, basically, there's an army right here that I can't see of Yomi's. And there's about to be another big battle here that will kind of decide who wins. Uh, if Tianxi loses their capital army here, this force, uh, they're basically screwed. I mean, they've got this army over here. They've got some forces of pretty good size over here facing Baratos, but Baratos has that very frightening Melkart. They've got a pretty significant army here as well. And Tianxi just will not be able to hold them off from both sides. So Tianxi and I now have an understanding that if they lose at their capital, I'm going to take Chilad and, you know, presumably as many of these provinces as I can get my grubby little hands on. Just to uh, expand. I had a random event over here that besieged my fortress. It's just villains. I am sending uh, Saburi and Jawad with a whole bunch of lions and infantry and some archers to take out the villains. I am also sending Quos Quan with my infantry, my summoned trolls, and some archers to take out the villains that have taken this province. Um, I don't think there's a spell that spawns villains, but if there was, I would suspect that this was a spell. I don't think there is. There might be. All of my other mages are researching so that I can hit construction level 6 this turn. I have also arranged with Tenchi to trade 50 water gems for 50 earth gems, which means that earth gems will no longer be limiting me when it comes to casting earth blood deep well. I should be able to do that pretty quickly. Um, enchantment will take a couple of turns to get to level 6, and then I'll need to get up to level 7. So... Turn-wise, that will be the limiter, will be enchantment research. So after this turn, I am going to alchemize pretty much every gem I can spare into death gems and just pump out as many skull mentors as I possibly can in order to equip my researchers with research bonuses because I desperately need research bonuses. My research now is, like, not completely terrible, but not good. And this is with every mage that I have researching, which I can't sustain for long. Down here, I did recruit one more Lion King. I've swapped recruitment over to Buddhas, because I don't need that many big nature mages, especially considering who it is that I'm likely to be fighting. Uh, Hinnom and Baratos are my next big enemies. Baratos against Baratos, Howl, and the other big nature spells can be useful. Against Hinnom, less so, because Hinnom's units are all giants. So, up here, I am storming this fortress with my army. Uh, I think this will be a pretty much a cakewalk. I've got a lot of archers. I don't have flaming arrows, unfortunately, so they're just archers at the moment. Um, I'll be able to summon a lot of skeletons. I have a whole bunch of summoned troops. I, I'm just going to try to overwhelm the fortress with numbers. Uh, this army is a little bit concerning. I'm bringing these forces also up to join with more summoned troops and infantry and all. Up here, uh, Matwa is taking the province of Mark. I would really like to keep White Peaks. I don't know if that's going to be possible. I'm kind of kind of have to negotiate with Ur to see about that. But in any case, we'll we'll negotiate some. Ur is indeed besieging Niflheim, and I anticipate they will take it. Over here, 
we have an army of 70 units consisting of mainly Gigjas. So this is like a lot of powerful mages. Taking this province would be a huge pain in the neck. Hopefully they'll scatter a little bit because the AI often does dumb things like that. But in any case, I'm also taking this province. Uh, it has a gold mine in it that brings in a lot of income and I would like to own it for myself. So hopefully this army won't move over here. If it does, Simai should be able to get away because he does have a province right here he can retreat to. Um, hopefully he'll get away. I've got Katibu ready and waiting with his 5 earth as soon as I forge the staff. He'll have 6 earth, and he will be just waiting to cast Earthblood Deep Well. I've got some summoned troops here that aren't moving because I need Asher and Buana researching for this turn. And uh, yeah, that's about where I am. I've got Mugo moving with his lions down this way. Uh, and he's going to search for nature sites in Resena, as well as be ready to move in and stake a claim if necessary. And of course, I have a whole bunch of scouts moving around. So that's kind of where the world is at right now. Um, Ur is very large. Baratos is pretty large. Hinnom actually is not the largest. But to my mind, Hinnom is probably one of the most dangerous. Um, Baratos obviously is also plenty dangerous, but not quite that dangerous. Um, of the remaining players, I may actually be in the worst position. I'm right in the middle of everybody. Well, except for Yomi. Yomi's in a worse position than I am, because Yomi, Yomi is just... Ugh. Yomi is just in a bad place. I'm shocked that they've done this well, to be honest. But, in terms of province numbers, I am probably similar to Hinnom and Baratos. Uh, I'm behind Ur. Agartha is going down. Tenshi is probably going down. I'm, But I'm looking forward and seeing in my mind's eye a late game where I am caught between Baratos and Hinnom. I've been good friends with Ur all along so far, but they might turn on me at any time. Uh, I've kind of, to be honest, I've kind of been using Ur as a cat's paw. I've kind of been using them to help me fight my wars that I wanted to fight so that I could expand with relatively little risk. And that's gotten me this far, but I really need to ramp up the research in order to get to where I need to be. And I, oof, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I need to start deploying mass elemental summoning pretty quickly. But, uh, ooh, baby. I just don't know. Anyway, uh, thank you all for watching, and I will see you in turn 41, where we will hopefully take the Fortress of Welrid, and then be able to kind of break this army out a little bit and take a bunch of these provinces. If I can get, like, this whole area, then I can also expand over here and claim most of Niflheim's territory, which would be fantastic, especially because Hinnom has not been. Uh, Hinnom appears to have been focusing exclusively northward, and not paying any attention to Niflheim down below. Which means that, if I can grab this territory, I might be able to secure just a whole lot of provinces for almost no cost. Uh, Jotun Jarls are going to be a problem. But, I mean, except for Forbidden Forest, Forbidden Forest is going to be a huge problem to take because they have just so many Gigjas. But, if I can take out Welrid and then grab all this, I'll be in pretty good shape. My income will go up and... I don't know, that'd be good. And then I have to decide who I hit next. Um, probably Yomi, to be honest, because Yomi is by far in the worst position. And jumping on them would, I think, take be of minimal cost, especially because I could just move straight north. Pretty much. Uh, I would have to... Well, I couldn't actually, because Sleepy Wolds is in the way. So I would have to shift my forces down this way and be recruiting mainly out of my capital. I am, by the way, recruiting Lion Warriors now. They're not great, but they are giants, and they do have the Spirit Club attack, which does fatigue damage. It's reduced for large targets, so it's not as good against giants as it could be, but it's something. It helps. Um... And the Kitharonic Lion Pelt gives protection to the head and the body. 
So they do effectively have two pieces of armor. So I can... I can work with Lion Warriors. I can buff them up. I can give them more strength. I can give them uh, more protection. Research-wise, in enchantment... Um... Not in enchantment. Hold up a second. It's an alteration. In alteration at level 7, I have access to Marble Warriors, um, which would be a decent buff. I do need to finish my research into enchantment first, and then swap over to alteration. It would be really good to go up higher in alteration. Um, it would also be really good to go up another couple of levels in evocation, because going up a couple of levels in evocation will give me magma eruption, and that would be pretty solid for my powerful earth buddhas um but we're just gonna kind of have to see where we go uh where we go from here i mean one strategy might be to get somebody boosted up real high in fire and start going in and suicide firestorming battlefields but um yeah we'll see where we can we'll see what we can accomplish in any case thank you for watching uh we've got our short-term plans set up Long term, like I said, probably we're going to attack Yomi and try and clear him out. Take those two thrones. Remember, the victory condition is not actually to kill everybody. The victory condition is the thrones. You need seven of them. I have two right now. Uh, right down here, the throne of Zeal and the throne of Spring. There's a throne there that I can take. There's a throne here that I can probably take. So that's four. The other three, one is in Hinnom's territory, one is deep in Ur's territory, and the seventh is in, uh, a seventh is in Beritos' territory. Um, there are some others. There's the Throne of Flames, which is currently claimed by Niflheim, so I should be able to grab that, hopefully. Where's the Throne of Flames? It's up there. Uh, maybe I can't take that. I'm going to try to take that. And then there's also the Throne in, Ka in Kasevic Highlands. The Throne in Kasev Kasevic Highlands, probably Hinnom is going to get. So I kind of have to write that one off. Unless I want to go to war with Hinnom, I write those two off. If I can take these two, that's four. Um, that's five. At that point... I have to start a very, very serious war. Because even if I have all three of those, which implies that TNG has been destroyed, um, I still need two more points. And so those two points, probably the easiest way to get them, quote-unquote easiest, is going to be to take uh, Kasevic Highlands, which is already close to me, and then declare war on Hinnom and just try and cripple him for long enough to take Moliton. Unfortunately, that will require a very serious siege because Moliton has 500 wall integrity. So I'm going to have to beat down Hinnom as well. Now, I may have an advantage here. If I can get the right spells, I might be able to launch a big assassination party and kill off all his Baals that have been summoning Seirs down here in the Wasteland. Um, he doesn't have all that many wasteland provinces. Ba'an Dagor is a wasteland province. 
Uh, Ochre Desert is a wasteland province. But beyond that, there's not many. So if I can take out his wastelands, that removes his ability to summon national demons like Seir's, which would be great. So that's definitely going to be part of the strategy, but in general, this game is going to involve at least one more just knock down, drag out, vicious war against a peer opponent on my part, which so far I've avoided, and the whole reason I've succeeded as much as I have is because I've avoided wars with peer opponents. <clears throat> like, right now, I, I mean, and this is how Dominions tends to go, you tend to have a whole bunch of wars that are basically one-sided, where two or three people gang up on one person, and then when you get to the end game, then comes the time where peer opponents for the first time go up against each other one-on-one -on -one and unleash their best tricks and figure out whose tricks are better. Uh, and to be honest, my tricks are probably not very good because I don't have much experience scripting armies. So that being said, I anticipate if I go into a war with Algulod or with Great Grey Shrike, or one of those people, uh, or even if I had gone into a war with Herdalas, who ran uh, Tian Shi, if I go into a war with one of those people, just head to head, with roughly equal forces, I would anticipate losing. Because A, because I probably haven't directed my research as well as I could have, and my research is lower than it should be. And B, because they're just much, much more used to what their units can do, because they played a lot in Dominions 4, and they've probably played more Dominions 5 than I have. And of course, Dominions 4 and Dominions 5 had a lot of similarities. But, so, basically, my best chance in such a war is to avoid having massive army confrontations be the focus of what happens, and instead try to cripple their ability to rebuild and maintain themselves through stealthy strikes and focus my forces in places where they're not expected. Uh, that's kind of what I'm going to have to do in order to pull it off. So hopefully I can, and we'll see. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in turn 41.